Afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Bones and Stones. Uh, we are happy today to have witness Mutsama Tira with us today, all the way from Sudan, who's busy sitting at the uh, UN Secretariat. So, witness, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. It's good to see a, a familiar face again. We haven't seen each other at Bits for, for quite a long time. We we uh, often used to see each other in the uh, in the lab at uh, uh, the basement of Origin Center. So, I haven't seen you for a while, and now we're all cooped up in our in our various it's offices. So it sounds so dodgy when that's how you introduce our guest. Oh, from your basement days somewhere. I mean, she's like. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. well, Thank you, guys. We, we thought we'd uh, bring you on today to discuss, obviously, a little bit about your, your research and stuff. Uh, we know you've been working mm -hmm. with uh, Professor Kareem Sadar uh, on Quinning, and you've been investigating some really interesting aspects using information systems and, and how uh, that can be used, uh, you know, to... Um, understand aspects of heritage management, maybe making people a bit more aware of the kind of heritage that we have. Quining is such an amazing site, and especially given that it's situated within Gauteng and within an area that is obviously developing. Uh, Gauteng, you know, as a, as a province is developing so quickly. So uh, maybe, witness, if we could start off with that, if you could maybe just talk us through how you got involved in the Quining, uh, Quining project and some of the maybe, uh, maybe some of the um, key components that you were looking at in terms of your research. Okay, um, so first of all, like uh, Kweneng is just uh, a part, uh, sort of like a portion, uh, sort of like the southern portion of my, my, my case study. I, I've been really uh, studying the southern Hauteng province from Jobek right up to uh, Vau River. So Kweneng is uh, just like a portion of, of my research, but basically my, my research uh, had indicated uh, I, I was studying uh, sort of like to see the efficacy of uh, heritage management uh, in that area when it comes to CRM reports. And so I used uh, GIS, QGIS to be specific, to sort of like um, test uh, uh, how effective heritage management has, has been in the area. And also just to, to understand the community, uh, com community opinions and perceptions and their worries and sort of like to just exhume some of their opinions about the stonewall structures and how they, they would want their heritage to be managed. And uh, it, 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 the, the last part it was uh, for me as, as I looked at education and awareness of uh, these stonewall structures in this in this whole area, looking for information technology ways and how we could uh, sort of like improve uh, education and awareness of uh, the stonewall structures in this area. Okay, thanks, witness. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Um, just in terms of uh, looking at your data sets, the data sets that you were working with um, for for the region, you know, obviously you've mentioned uh, geographic information systems. Were you using a lot of uh, kind of spatial data um, that fitted in with a, a lot of the lidar data that was recorded for the Quinang project, or were you also using historic imagery as well? Uh, what what were you kind of feeding into your your uh, GIS model? Uh, no, basically, I was using um, I was using uh, um, historical area of photographs, which I got from um, NGI, um, which is which is based in Cape Town. Um, so um, it was based on uh, historical uh, area of photographs, and also just to uh, use Google Earth as part of the as part, sort of like to verify if the site is partially destroyed is it still standing i mean how 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 away is it located now is it is it under threat to any form of development any form of recent development uh, at the moment okay that's interesting uh, witness i'm just going to hand over to tim he's got a question for you yeah that so how do you when it came to doing assessments and looking at the crm uh, reports and so on how did you assess the efficacy of those reports versus the data sets that you were working with so basically what i did was um the the, the first task for me was to identify um all this uh, sort of like the older areas uh, through historical aerial photographs which had been done in 1961 by um, sort of like uh, the Gauteng uh, um, municipality when, when they were trying to do even development and expansion. So um, they were black and white, of course, but you could uh, see tiny uh, dots on those historical er er area of photographs, uh, which looks, which sort of like looks like uh, smallpox, like on skin. Then I, I circled almost all of them and created these uh, slates, which I could import into QGIS to sort of like uh, use both um, Google 
earth and to sort of like pin each one of them and also now assess to see okay is it still then is it still there is it destroyed or um, it has been then i then went into the archives for for um heritage uh, impact assessments uh where i would uh, look because uh, vids uh, was part of um uh, sort of like the researchers that did a lot of work uh, in the south of Gauteng and also um, Sahara. So I was looking and tracing uh, the, the site when it comes to uh, the, the boxes. They, they sort of like mapped them in such a way that they had this area archival map which they had boxes of CRM reports for each region across Gauteng. So I just concentrated on southern Gauteng to see if a CRM uh, was done. Um, if it was done, uh, was there enough information for anyone come maybe later. I also used, um, you know, Saris, you know, I think that that, that online platform, that is platform, uh, just to test some of those uh, CRM reports. And, and with your results, did you find that a lot of the sites had been preserved or have a lot of them unfortunately been destroyed now? Oh, oh my God, a, 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 an extensive amount of them were destroyed uh, actually without any form of uh, of record uh, maybe if the record was there probably it was it was um, it was destroyed or no one knows where it is which is uh, part of uh, sort of like my argument in my in my phd to say uh, there's a lot of information management that needs to be done when it comes to crm reports a lot of updating that needs to be done when it comes to C C to, to when it comes to C saris sort of like to enhance it for, for for it to be more effective and more accessible to the public not only just to the public but also um, to the members of the community uh, like uh, uh, who are the custodians of uh, southern Gauteng province um, and also you know something i was also looking at was okay where the community is consulted before the sites were destroyed before developed and and in my second paper, I, I was discussing the issues that um, I also got results that not many communities were, were, were consulted before these heritage sites were, were destroyed. And uh, actually, most of them were not even aware that any form of development oh. done with any form of consultation. And the most interesting part about stonewall structures is that, um, you know, these were sort of like residences you know, where you would find sort of like a comprehensive uh, types of heritage, where you have the nature itself, where you have the stonewall structures itself and things like the graves. So most of the communities were really complaining that uh, most of their heritage sites were, were destroyed without their consultation, uh, you know, which is um, to them um, against, uh, uh, it's sort of like it's against uh, the, 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 the legal frameworks of South Africa. Thanks, thanks, witness. If, if I could maybe just um, uh, take us back a step, you know, when we talk about things like urban sprawl uh, developments, things like that, in other words, all of these uh, factors that are, um, you know, they, they could potentially lead to the destruction of these stonewalled settlements. I mean, when we talk about things like urban sprawl, are we only talking about um, infrastructural developments or are we possibly talking about things like illegal dumping? Uh, clearing of land for agricultural purposes, perhaps things like that. So, and then the second part of the question is with your research, did you then um, essentially quantify or at least classify what you could see were the most important um, or significant kind of uh, processes causing site destruction? Um, and then did you then kind of plug that into a new site management plan perhaps? So, so, so basically, um, I, I also acquired, uh, sorry to, to just had missed that. Um, I also acquired, uh, you know, development footprints, uh, which I could import in QGIS. Um, actually, those are the ones that I used to sort of like compare if the site was destroyed. So I looked at uh, infrastructure development. I looked at transport and power line development. I, I, I guess you understand um, when it comes to power line uh, approvals for power lines, when they want to um, sort of like put a power line, they have to clear the land below. And you'd find that over time, uh, most trees would have grown within the stone walls themselves. Mm -hmm. So most of them were cleared in that process. Then you'd find, I also looked at water body development. Uh, I also looked at mining development and also mining waste development. Um, so an extensive number. So I, I, I really did quantify those. And uh, I would really urge a lot of people to read my paper, which was published in the Southern, Southern Archaeological Bulletin, to really see, you know, 
the extensive uh, damage that was done without any form of um, uh, information uh, management, which was done to, because basically, you know, the argument is always you can't keep. It's understood that you can't keep everything, but however, uh, if you're not keeping some, if you're not keeping everything, uh, what what amount of um, of record keeping are you really and and recording of those sites that are are you really uh, documenting uh, when it comes to the excavations? Okay, which excavation is related to this kind of site? Sort of like so that maybe if you discover maybe something in in the future, um, are you able to sort of like remap and reshape? Um, how those societies lived, uh, given the fact that uh, the last 500 years is we have little information about the last 500 years in South Africa. Mm. I suppose it's so, so, so important, as you say, I mean, it's important to be able to relate sites as well. I mean, the reality is, mm -hmm. is that uh, Gauteng or Southern Gauteng would have been a, a dynamic cultural paleo landscape. And unfortunately, obviously, a lot of these sites have been destroyed. Kuning is such an important example of of a, a large stone wall settlement, and there would have been others. That's the thing. And unfortunately, as you say, a lot of them have been uh, destroyed by uh, developments, obviously through time. But uh, witness, I'm just going to hand over to Tim. He's got another question for you. Yeah, just on what you were saying now, um, and, and it's such a good point, is like, how do we record and preserve this information for future generations to be able to ask future questions that we may not actually have or know at this stage? So in, in your work, did you outline a, a system or a way that we should start to tackle these issues? Because in Gauteng, for example, it's not a very large area, but it has a very high density population, a high growth rate, urban sprawl, a lot of development going on. So we're going to continue, continue to destroy and impact these archaeological sites. So are there ways that we can improve the systems that are in place? Or is it more a case of how we manage these systems? Or, or what did you find in that regard? So, so for me, what I, I, I really, what resonated mostly in my research was the issue of education and awareness. I mean, you, you cannot preserve what you actually don't know is important, really. Um, and, and most of the people that you would find it more probably at Tipi Beerbeck and uh, Soika Postran. When it comes to Soika Postran, like where Kweneng is, uh, most of the people would just go there with their bikes and they hike and they do all these activities. But they, they're not aware. As much as some information was put in the museum, uh, but Historic is as extensive and educative enough for, for people to really understand and to take time to sort of like know and have the knowledge of what these sites mean and who were associated with these sites, you know, and stuff like that. And most of it really comes, that sort of like ignorance sort of like comes from the sort of like the, uh, the colonial elements of what is important, what is not important, what do we educate, our education system in our curriculum, which, is, which are some of the issues that I really touched on my on my third paper, which was uh, just published in this Italian book, uh, when it comes to developing communication skills in archaeology, which was published in Italy, so um, some of those issues um, are embedded in the way and uh, colonially, where you'd find um, uh, as much as there there was a need, there was I, I should give credit there was a need for, there, there was an identification of the need to, to sort of like document some of those heritage sites. But there was so much of a gap of trying to save for you to document actually the information, such that as much as the site is gone, but you have extensive information for you to educate the young ones, for you to educate uh, also other people. And then with, you know, you mentioned the communities that you worked with and that, that, that's an entirely, you know, sort of different set of problems that, that I guess you faced in your, in your work. And one of the issues I'm wondering about is, you know, with, with, with uh, land expropriation in that part of South Africa historically, with people being um, booted off their land, um, how did you, or how were you able to then trace these lineages of people who are living in those communities historically who are no longer present? Uh, also linked to the, the you know colonial occupation of this region. Oh, it was a daunting task. Why? Because also communities in South Africa, especially like Wapena, Bamare Pahole, have been very vigilant in who they talk to, why they talk to them, especially with the mistrust that is between um, the heritage professionals and the communities, which I think uh, was extensively written about by by Maskell when he when was looking at sort of Social, the, the social economic dynamics of communities and the relation of the relationship between communities and professionals from from uh, across across southern Africa. So um, I, I could also tell 
uh, you know, with their skepticism, them even talking to me. Actually, I was very then very lucky. Then I just met um, uh, one of uh, the, um, the the managers of Cliff Previerbeck, who said, "Okay, are, are you interested to talk to the Wapenamare Papole?" Uh, after maybe I think almost uh, eight months looking for them and reading articles and trying to get into contact with them, but I was failing to get into contact with them. Then luckily they they responded very well. Then I started to go to their community events, which they did on Sundays. Uh, they would organize some events where I would talk to them. So I just made it into focus groups for me to sort of like really understand um, what their concerns are because people here back at the moment is actually. Um, it's it, it actually contested when it comes to, to, the, to, to the land uh, and the communities are claiming back their land and uh, they've been doing that ever since 1995. And you'd also understand the dynamics of how the legislation itself is structured in such a way that it sort of like disadvantages the communities for them to prove ownership of their land when it comes to things like oral history, you know. So them as a community have, uh, have in the past started initiatives to document their oral history. And I can gladly say that uh, uh, me and Karim were one of the coordinators uh, between the VIS library and the community for them to be able to have the VIS library to be a, a repository of some of the books and researches and, and oral history uh, or, or oral knowledge they managed to gather themselves because they are very organized. I, I, I was quite impressed. That's, I mean, that's great to hear. And it's, it's really nice that, you know, like what you and Karim have done then, you know, is to facilitate this. It's kind of like, um, you know, writing some of the wrongs, at least of the past is now going in and recording these oral histories that, as you pointed out earlier, colonially were not um, considered significant. And now we know, you know, in this country, we have such a vibrant history and all of these different elements of our past are pretty important, but it wasn't all written down. So it's great that archaeologists can now have an impact in terms of recording these historical oral traditions. And of course, the fact that this oral tradition is being brought into archaeolo archaeological methodology is also a really great testament to how we practice archaeology nowadays in, in Southern Africa, which all across the world, which is wonderful. Yes. Yes, yes, because yes. also another interesting part was that, you know, um, you know, when I was talking about the attitude, the community attitude and the public attitude towards things of archaeology, how our minds, like sort of like we had been shaped for us to be able to sort of like reject our own heritage. And I think a lot of work has been done by uh, people like uh, Amanda Esther Hazen uh, mm -hmm. from this University. I think you know her. She wrote, she wrote extensive work and impressive work on when it comes to heritage education. Um, but you know, the, the, the reason why the, their work has not been sort of like supported by the government when it comes to things like funding has been that attitude towards heritage. So I think heritage awareness and, edu and education sort of like changes people's attitudes, sort of like to prioritize um, the knowledge that people can gain from their own uh, historic heritage. I agree, yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, thanks, witness. Just to maybe uh, have a look at, you know, kind of CRM projects moving forward. I mean, um, obviously it's important going forward now that, you know, whatever archaeology is there needs to be recorded, you know, in, in a manner that um, is sustainable at least. Um, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the necessary procedures need to be put in place, the, the necessary consultation as well. Um, in, in your research, did you explore maybe possibly some of the, the best practices which should be implemented from a CRM point of view in terms of how these sites are dealt with in the region? Yes. Um, so, so, so my 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 final uh, paper, which is which was uh, which is uh, the the one which is in a book chapter, talks about um, how we can also not just use technology for 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 only improving, but also to document some of uh, the information and sort of like use it as a tool that can assist in the documentation and um, sort of like access to this information. Um, uh, that is part of what I did. But in the future, I'm also looking at also exploring and experimenting some of these methods and best practices that I have suggested in my in my book chapter to see if it's possible, if it's not possible, why is it not possible, how can we improve it for it to be possible, which one is possible, which one can we prefer, which one is cost effective, given the sort of like economic dynamics in South Africa when it comes to funding of um, heritage. Uh, witness, just to uh, maybe touch on again, uh, you know, the heritage awareness and the education aspects, and obviously you mentioned the, the work of Amanda Esthazen uh, at, at Vitt University. Mm -hmm. um, 
But just to, to look at it from the context of the Stonewall settlements in, in Gauteng, I mean, do you think that a regional kind of approach towards making people aware that this heritage is there, um, at least so it doesn't get destroyed from a development point of view, do you think a regional scale approach is more appropriate? Or do you think um, a more local scale approach is more favorable, uh, you know, depending on the kind of nature mm. of the sites and where they are? Mm. As much as I would prefer a regional approach to, um, to heritage uh, awareness and, 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 and probably education or probably heritage management interventions, but, you know, there's always a sort of like a, a, a policy, political, legal policy beyond boundaries, you know, uh, how would you navigate that? Given the fact that heritage um, is part of is part of politics, when it comes to Southern Gauteng, um, there is evidence that you can use archaeological heritage sites as evidence for land claims. Uh, I mean, the land reform uh, program it, it can become a bit tricky. But however, I think um, individually as South Africa, I think South Africa is even capable of even doing that. They only need for things like, like legislation implementation. Um, the legislation is, is is fine and can be improved, but is is for me, in my view, um, is is usable. But it only needs um, uh, mechanisms that make sure that they implement some of um, the the legislation that they have they have put in order to protect and preserve the uh, heritage. Thanks, witness. I'll go hand over to Tim. He's got a question for you. Yeah, it's just the last question, I think, from my side. It's, you know, uh, what we often see in South Africa that um, CRM practitioners and academia is a bit, you know, sort of separate. Um, so did you find when you were engaging, obviously coming from an academic perspective and working on CM reports and, and heritage impact assessments, archaeological impact assessments, did you, are, are you, have you been consulting and working closely with any of the CRM um, practitioners in the country? And uh, in terms of your recommendations and your findings, is that something that CRM companies are going to, or at least are you hoping that they take on board and start to think about as they conduct their work? Mm. Responses from uh, developers and uh, CRM practitioners, um, I, as I mentioned in my second paper, were not that um, welcoming. Why? Because there's always a threat of how much information you can get. And there's always, there's always that power dynamic of, um, okay, uh, would you uh, mess up with your livelihood when it comes to, to, to issues like, like that. But however, um, I mean, some of them, those that re responded, um, were really keen in some of the methods that they were going to use. But it all boils down to Sarah. What kind of policies would you recommend any CRM to come? Because it, now with GPS, how can you have a CRM report without GPS probably coordinates for you to improve the location of that heritage site? Um, when it comes to issues of social media, how can you use media for you to communicate with communities? And in what language? And who are you talking to? Do you know where the communities are? You're talking to the public. So you can't just go probably on a more and, and maybe hand out questionnaires or ask, do you know anything about this? But probably have sort of like an extensive research. And also, it's, it's a challenge to ask health professionals, for us to probably do our work more extensively when it comes to issues of um, ethno uh, archaeology, when it comes to knowing and understanding um, the, the people and communities that are associated with healthy sites. And um, there's also another flip side to it, whereby most of the communities, some of them were, were dislocated. But well, that's a different case when it comes to the uh, Hapteng province. Why? Because the community is there. It's well organized. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got community leadership and they've got well-structured policies and proposals which they've created before. But in the rest of like South Africa and other regions, because of land reform and uh, that had happened before, you know, quite difficult sometimes for them to locate who really the owners of that heritage is. But um, the effort has to be has to be made for, yeah, for, sure. for people to understand yeah. if it's true or not. Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks, witness. I think uh, we'll we'll end it there before we get booted off Zoom. I see we've only got a few minutes left. But witness, thanks very much. I really appreciate your time today uh, to come and chat about these obviously very important issues and stuff. Sorry, I should have said at the beginning uh, that you're busy awaiting <laughs> your final reviews for your PhD. So we wish you the best of luck. I'm sure it'll go it'll go well, and soon we're going to be calling you doctor. Uh, but yeah, Thank all, you. All <laughs> and uh, it was great that you could join us all the way from Sudan today. And yeah, hopefully we'll get to see you again soon to chat about some uh, more of your interesting research in the future. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, guy, thank you for welcoming me and uh, 
Um, welcome me to, to, to your interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.